Call to order the uh, April 24th meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. Uh, on the agenda tonight, we have approval of meeting minutes from the March 21 meeting, uh, Great Pond Preserve 2 Resource Protection Permit, the Holt Private Road Review and Nelson Private Access Way Permit, and then at the end, uh, public comment on items not on the agenda. So um, we'll go roll from here, minutes from March 21, any? Make a motion to accept the minutes. The motion, do I have, do I have a second? Second, Jonathan? All right, any comments on the, all those in favor? Opposed, abstaining, we're good. Okay, that's done. All right, next item is Great Pond Preserve 2 Resource Protection Permit. The Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is requesting a resource protection permit to alter 1,960 square feet of RP2 wetland and RP1 buffer to construct boardwalk for trail crossings at the Great Pond Preserve 2 property located adjacent to Sweet Fern Road. Section 19-8-3, Resource Protection Permit Completeness and Public Hearing will be held tonight. So, uh, I'll have uh, Maureen to give a summary of the project and then you can get prepared to roll after that. How's that? Uh, so, what you have tonight is um, extension of trails on the Great Prawn Preserve 2, uh, which is a, a long property that's a uh, very close to Fenway Road and just upland of Great Pond. Uh, the Great Pond Preserve 2 property is owned by the Land Trust. They assembled a committee that includes two members of the Conservation Committee and came up with a trail alignment plan. And I wanted to make sure that everyone received tonight the comments from the Conservation Committee, which basically are supportive of the proposed trail alignments. Uh, there's an extensive amount of trails that are proposed, but only the portion of the trails that are in wetland areas uh, require a planning board review. The applicant has requested three sections of boardwalk that are in RP2 wetlands. Uh, I added a fourth section. When they submitted their final plan, it became apparent that one of the existing trail sections that they would be adding boardwalk is not in a wetland, but it is in a wetland buffer, and it also requires a permit. So I would recommend that the total square footage is really just under 2,000 square feet. Um, with that, I'm going to stop in case anyone has any questions. Okay. Now the first item will be the completeness of the application, and then once that's decided, we can determine whether to go on. Now it's up to you. <laughs> Um, so yes, we've hung the map up here and we've also provided this map for each of you in your packet. I see some of you are opening them. And um, first off, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. We are very excited about this new property. It's an opportunity for community members all over town, but particularly in that area, to have access to some new trails. Some of them have been there for a long time, kind of unofficial trails on a property that was owned at the time by Mr. Glue. I think he's allowed access, although it was never official. So this will allow for some official access on some existing trails, plus additional access to some new trails. And as Maureen stated, um, and I'll, I'll look at exactly where you're adding it in, Maureen, but so it looks like it's 2,000, um, linear feet or square feet, square feet of, of area that would be impacted in a wetland. And you can see up on here, I guess I'll just speak really loudly, there are, there are three areas. So if we start up at the top, there's an area here where we would need to put in boardwalking that goes through the wetland. We'd be pulling the trail out of the wetland here. There's actually two trails here, but we'd stay on the one that's not in the wetland, and then we'd go back in again to cross a small stream for 61 feet of wetland. And then again, up here, there's an area where there's 90 feet of wetland that we would do a crossing. So what I would like to do with you briefly tonight is just walk through our proposal quickly, because there are a few variances that we've asked for, and 
and also that's where some of the real details are described. So as you can see with number one, this is the detailed site plan. I'm happy to answer any questions. It includes the topographic map, although because we have the wetland delineation, we've asked that we can do the two foot intervals instead of one foot intervals. So that is one um, request that we've put in front of the board. Um, we've, we've attached a full written description of the property and and, and also this map here includes all of the abutters. So you have a, a clear delineation of those who are abutters to this property. The wetland map was done by a soil scientist. They tested the soils to delineate where the wetlands were. So we're saying that that is part of that mapping study and part of the wetland map. The location and flow of all water courses is shown on your map. We are asking that we not need to do a stormwater runoff plan because there will not be a significant amount of altered topography leading to additional runoff. And in fact, any of the boardwalking that we would put in would primarily be above the wetland so that the flow would still be allowed to happen. We've shown you a few pictures of some of the type of boardwalking and shown you the exact um, distances that we would be, go we'd be going and the, and the square foot and linear feet as well. So you can see the, the different photos. In one location, and that's this location up here, we put in two examples because we do not know yet whether or not we would be able to afford putting in a boardwalk that would be adequate for horses. Otherwise, the horses would not be using the crossings, the other two crossings on the wetland that we've talked about. If horses are to use the property, and we're certainly open to that, they would just cross the stream on their own. And, but there would be this one place up there where it they would need a boardwalk to be able to access this. We've met with local um, horse riders in the area. So that's why we've said one or the other, but one is more expensive than the other, so we'd have to figure out how we were gonna afford it if we were gonna make it accessible to the horses. Um, we are requesting a waiver on the vegetation um, mapping, and, and that's because, again, we have the wetland maps. Um, this obviously can't be located at another site because kind of what we do is provide trail and public access to people and that's why we bought the property so people could use it. So those are the, the primary um, points. I'm kind of new to this. I've come to one of your workshops but I have not presented to the planning board like this. So maybe the best thing is, is if there are things I've missed or specific questions. Okay. Does that work? That's fine. Yep. And I'm going to add the first thing that I neglected to ask you to do was to please state your name. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Cynthia Crum. I'm the executive director of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. And I also do have two members of the Land Trust with me if you have questions for non employees uh, about the property. <laughs> so, right. so um, if there are, I'm going to start, I'm going to do this a little backwards. Are there any questions from the board on completeness? On completeness only. Okay. All right. I will open this up to the public to comment on completeness. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to comment on the completeness of this application? All right. That being said, no further comment? Do I, go right ahead, Jonathan. Oh, I just have a motion for the Go right ahead. Uh, motion for completeness, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust for a resource protection permit to construct 1,920 square feet of boardwalk and bridging in RP2 wetlands and an RP1 wetland buffer be deemed complete. All right. So now I'm going to open this up for public hearing on, oh, excuse me. Oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we get a vote, don't we? I just want to get out of here. So that's just, sorry, go right ahead. Second. That's a good idea. All right. 
I'm just rolling along in my head. So, uh, any, any other comments? All right. All those in favor? It's unanimous, so I won't ask if anyone's opposed. So, um, now, all right, now I'll stop rushing ahead and uh, open this up for public hearing on the merits of this project. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on the merits of this project? Or has questions or concerns? All right, I'll close the public hearing on that and I'll open it up to the board for comments on the project or questions that are regarding the project. Motion for approval. Oh, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> A motion for approval? Oh, uh, no. We have a question. You beat me to it? No, she's got a question. <laughs> I guess it's been a while, Jim, since you've been here. got a few questions. Okay. Go right ahead. Um, okay. No particular order. Um, I know you're still making up your mind about the horse and the pedestrian boardwalk. Are they the exact same width for feet across? Yes. That we list it that way because that is the width for the horse. <laughs> okay. Um, and so my, my next questions do go around numbers. Um, and maybe, Jim, I'll need you, you know, because I have to uh, tell the square footage. And so one of your boardwalks, uh, let's see, the length is, okay, in one you say the length may be 155 or it may be 200. And so if you take 200 and you times it by four, you get a number that bumps you above your 2,000 square foot. So I just wanted to look at some of these numbers oh, okay. put down because they're not working out. Like, and actually, Suzanne is the specialist on the width. Would we do three or four feet if we're not doing the horses, though? We can get away with using three. It's three no. feet if we're not doing the horses, so do maybe that's... Do you want to go low and not go a little higher while you're here so you don't have to come back? Well, we'd be I better mean, off going higher. You're absolutely right. Well, I yeah. will put it out to the rest of the board. What, I mean, do you want to see them lowball this, or would you rather see them... I have a question. So, I have a question. If, if it's appertaining to horses, you've got a four-foot wide, you've got somebody walking along and a horse coming in the opposite direction, four feet is enough, or do you have to step off the boardwalk? to allow the horse to go through. Four feet is the width that's used by the state for a horse. Suzanne, well, you, wanna, you wanna stand up at the podium oh. and respond. And give your name, Susan, Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne McGinn, Stewardship Chair, Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. Thank you. So f four feet was the designated width, if you look um, on the state's um, requirements for a horse boardwalk. That's that what we followed. Does that include passing? I mean, I don't know whether... That was it, not specified in the state document. I guess it's a question worthwhile asking because, you know, kid walking in one direction, a horse in another. My expectation is that I know I would stand and wait for the horse to go by before I stepped onto the boardwalk, and I would assume if if a rider was coming up and a person was on a boardwalk, that the rider would, would also give that same courtesy. Question. I, you know, and, and on our shore road path, I was on the shore road path committee. It's five feet wide, but when there's two bikes, someone usually pulls over, so the other person, so. So back to uh, the length. Um, okay, is, so. So um, the ex. Oh, yeah, and maybe the I possibility just that you might go to 200 feet in one section, is that? Right. I mean, that one section, it's about 200 feet of um, wetland. So what we needed to determine once it's wet, like it will be the rest of this week, is how much of the area actually needs to be covered. So we were looking at this in the winter. So that's why I said up to 200, because it actually looks like it could be as low as 100 during the time we've looked at it. But I wanted to include the full amount that was in the wetland. So yeah, what number would you like to go with so that you don't have to come back? So let's do 200 times four. Yeah. Okay, so that now we have is 2140. Maureen did the math. Total, total. 2140 total. Is that allowable? Is that an allowable 2144. Total? That's what I got, too. Um, you also, I won't go into it, but you had a couple of other numbers times four that weren't working out. 
But I do agree with what Maureen just said. I got, if you go with your 200 and you correct the other mistakes, 2,144 square feet. Okay. So. I don't know if the board has any comments on that, but I got a higher number and I'm just wondering. I really appreciate you doing the math. Thank you. That's helpful. So you'd like, okay. So, so let's do that number. So then on your map here, this number does need to be changed. Your total proposed wetland impact is now 2,144 square feet. And your total boardwalk will be 436 feet. And if somebody would like to check my math on the total length of the boardwalk using 200 instead of 155. So those numbers on your map will have to be changed. Okay. Okay. Um, 406, you said? I got 536 feet. 536. Somebody certainly check my math. I can't do math that fast without a calculator. <laughs> It'd be the length. What I'm doing is I'm adding up the length of 90, 61, 200, and 185. And that's what I got. Now, are you adding this 185 here? Yes, I am because... So the, all of that is included in what, in what Maureen stated? Because part of it's inside of this line. Yeah, that's upland, but then part of it might be inside the wetland buffer, and that's what you were stating, Maureen. But otherwise, the 185 wasn't included because it was upland. But part of it is in the 250? Yeah. Okay, how much is in the 250? Have you, uh, that, I, I don't know. Because that needs a resource protection permit because you're in an overlay district. You're in the 250-foot buffer. So I'm, I want to go with your numbers, but I don't want you to aim low. I want you to aim a little higher so you don't have to come back. Okay, so it's on this map, it's about a third. So I'd say to be comfortable, let's say 100 feet, you know. All right, now that changes some other numbers. So now it's 400. So to, to answer that question, on the map, that, that section that I added, the map says 185 feet long. Some of it's in the wetland buffer, some of it is not. I put in the whole 185 feet. Okay, and is that what you recommend? That's I, fine. I would recommend that you go, that you permit more than you need. Okay. Because then, not that it isn't fun to come back here and see us, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then let's do the 185, and those are the numbers you already have. Okay. Um, so that's the 536, okay. Yeah, and I just want to make sure, I'm sorry about this. H have you received back any of your permits? Um, did you? The DEP? Yeah. DEP. No, we're working on that, but obviously we wouldn't start the work until we have that. Okay, so that's still pending. And we're working actually with the same consultant on that. Okay. Um, uh, just an FYI, your book and page, they're both wrong. And I only mention that because sometimes we see, like we just mentioned, seeing each other again. Um, don't rely on your book and page. They're both wrong. So it doesn't have anything to do with your application, but FYI. So. Oh. Anyways, um, just checking everything so that when you come back, if you ever do in regards to this, you're not relying on bad information. Um, I think that is it, and I guess in our motion, if we agree on the numbers, we're going to have to just refer to those when whoever makes the motion. And that was it. I just want to make sure your numbers were correct. And so all these numbers include your ramps. I guess that's my last question. Any ramps that may be necessary are included in your numbers? Yeah. Okay. Then I think I've covered what I wanted to cover to make sure you got your numbers right. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. So right now the horses for this part of the property go through the neighborhood on the paved roads. If we put in a boardwalk here which does not require bridging, they would be able to go there and then just cross the stream and get onto this path. And so, so they won't actually be using bridges that are the ones that we've depicted that are lifted up because those are just in the two areas they wouldn't use. Uh, 
suitable for passing the horses? Yeah, great question. And yes, we've already discussed that, and absolutely, we will do that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Just one, one question with the, um, the Duralite stationary dock, if you have to use that, do you have to remove that during the winter? No, you don't. It's the same um, docking that's been used along the green belt on Great Pond. All right. And that's lasted really well. That's one reason we're choosing it, because it's lasted so well over there. It's expensive, but we, we're thinking it's going to last. Thanks. Did you want to discuss the site walk? I mean, is this, are we going to actually well, make a motion for? Do we, is, do people feel there is a need for a site walk? Two no's, three no's, no, no. four no's. Because we got the memo saying the conservation committee, at least two members were out there. Um, I think it's always important that somebody that's representing the town go out and look at these sites. And where I got that confirmation before I was kind of on the fence, I'm going to say, Somebody has been out there, and I don't need a site walk. So I think the we'll ticks are really bad this time of year, too. Yeah, <laughs> so there's a good reason. A good reason. <laughs> there's a good reason. Uh, so, okay, I think we're all in agreement, then, that we don't need a site walk for this particular project. Yeah, and we've done three site walks with those two members of the Conservation Committee. So, Victoria, would you like to make the motion? Actually, oh, but you have Jim? so much. You, you, Jim, you've got your you notes. Yeah, I thought Jim made the motion. Uh, <laughs> I tried to make the motion. Your, your microphone.
the application of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust for a resource protection permit to construct 19, uh, 2144 square feet of boardwalk and bridging in RP2 wetlands and RP1 wetland buffer to be approved with the following condition. One, that any uh, required permits from the main DEP or the Army Corps be obtained prior to any installation of boardwalks. I, uh, actually, and could we um, add another motion that the um, plat be updated to show the correct square footage, length of all uh, boardwalks um, that are proposed? A condition of approval, if that's okay. Update the plan. Is that okay yes. to update uh, the plan? Yes, I guess uh, that the, the drawing is the drawing number. Uh, the Albert Trick drawing. Jim, so Jim, you can just say I accept that friendly. I agreement. accept that friendly. <laughs> <laughs> and is that one copy, or so you're Maureen? I'm not sure. Fourteen oh, copies. I'll help you with that. Okay. You don't have to do. 14 sets. Okay. <laughs> All right. Second. Second. Jonathan seconds. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? And it's unanimous. You're good. Good. Thank you. You'll be a pro soon enough. <laughs> The next item on the agenda is the Holt Private Road Review. Dr. William Holt is requesting a private road review to upgrade his existing driveway to provide frontage for a new lot to be created at the end of Running Tide Road, uh, section 19-7-9. And tonight we are here to discuss completeness of the application. So Bob, would you like to introduce yourself to us I again? I shall. Thank you, Chair Jordan and members of the board. I'm Bob Metcalf with Mitchell & Associates, representing Dr. Holt, who is here with me this evening. Uh, the last time we were before you to discuss completeness, there were a number of items from the town engineer's review that you wanted to have us look at prior to making a determination for that, and we have made all those changes, and then there are some subsequent minor tweaks that are in uh, Mr. Harding's review. But I'll. Uh, I can walk you right through where we, uh, to bring you uh, through the project again in terms of highlighting what's being proposed. Uh, the private access road, I'm going to go through what the existing portion, the existing portion of the Holt property we're talking about is where the current driveway comes through here, runs down to about that property line, comes back and along here and along the water and back. The total area of that parcel is 10.43 acres. Uh, what we're looking at doing is providing that private access road to serve a, a new lot. I uh, just want to go over some of the existing items on here. Hopefully it's showing up in here. It's, there's a red line that runs, a dash line that runs along here. That is the 250 foot setback from the RP1 wetland, which is in this area in here. Uh, we also have identified the 75 foot shoreline, excuse me, stream setback line, which runs in this location in here. One of the other restrictions that are on the property is a view easement, uh, view shed to serve the properties along this side of the property. And basically, this area that is all hatched in blue is a restricted area to protect the view, act, view easement across out to the water. There are a couple of other easements that occur on the property. There's one that the water district has for the water main that comes in to roughly here. Uh, there's access to the sewer treatment plant. There's also a stormwater easement that picks up the drainage from a catch basin on running tide that comes down and discharges to the stream in this location. And then there's another easement that comes down along this location and ties into another culvert that goes underneath the driveway and ties out in that same location. Uh, there is a private tote road that provides access across the property, uh, that provides access to the Dufford property on the side, which has no road frontage. 
as well as provides uh, pedestrian access for three properties along this side of the property to get access down to the beach. There's also an easement that runs through this right-of-way section in here that provides pedestrian as well as some drainage uh, rights uh, that serves and then comes across the, the driveway itself and acts as a, path, access, a pathway that leads down to the beach area as well. What do we got here? Why is it not moving? Excuse me. Interesting how it was set up. Sorry. <laughs> All right. These are the proposed uh, improvements. Uh, this is the proposed lot two that was being configured in order uh, that the private access road is being provided for. Uh, this, the 50 foot wide right of way, and actually in a couple of locations it's actually a little bit wider, but that is, serves uh, for the right of, way, right of way for the proposed road as well as frontage for the proposed lot. Uh, comes down to here. The Holt driveway actually, as I said, runs right up through that location. The right of way, at, the roadway itself will be aligned along the, uh, the driveway itself. There's also, in terms of RP wetlands, we had delineated. There's a small pocket of RP2 wetland here, and then there's a small pocket of RP2 wetland here, and I'll get into a little more discussion on where we were on that uh, from the last board meeting in a few minutes. Primarily the site, uh, as you can tell by this darker line in here, this is an existing vegetated area, uh, woodland area. Along this side, it's a mixture of uh, overstory as well as some shrub scrub vegetation within the wetland. And then it's the same, similar situation here. It's wooded and then there's some mixed shrub scrub down towards the water itself. There's also the open meadow area that runs along this portion of the field in here uh, that encumbers part of the, the lot area proposed for lot two. And this is where that tote road cuts across the proposed lot two. As I indicated, the easement for the tote road also provides access for several properties along this side for them to be able to get access down uh, to the beach area. As far as drainage on the driveway itself, besides the ones I just referred to, there are two 36-inch culverts that carry the existing stream that runs in this direction through and discharges out by the beach. Actually, roughly in this location here, it goes back into culverts on the other side. It comes out of the 36 inch, twin 36-inch culverts, is exposed, and is picked up by another culvert before it's then discharged near the shoreline. There were several waiver requests that we discussed the last time. The first one of those is to reduce the width of the road from 22 feet of pavement down to 14 feet with two-foot gravel shoulders that'll be grassed. Uh, which I apologize last time for some reason it got deleted from the waiver list. Since I do all my, did my typing, it's my error for deleting it. Uh, the other requ waiver request is for the closed storm drain system and curbing uh, required for the road standards uh, based on the reduction in width of the road and the minimal increased impervious area and runoff. If we were to put curbing and enclosed storm drains in there, we'd wind up having to go to a full 22-foot wide roadway. So the waiver is requested for that. The T turnaround uh, was reviewed in the field with the fire chief, as well as uh, identifying a location for a fire hydrant. Uh, subsequent to our last meeting, the Portland Water District was reviewing the request for the fire hydrant and worked with Chief Gleason to identify it. the hydrant up in this location here uh, and the water district wants it down in this location here. Uh, the mapping information they were provided by the water district show the eight inch water line coming down this side and it actually comes down this side so that's why the hydrant has to be relocated has to be located on this side of the roadway uh, near the terminus of the eight inch main and that was as I said uh, Chief Gleason had reviewed that with the water district. The other waiver request was the alignment of the roadway. And again, we're trying to follow pretty much where the driveway is right now. 
It's a 10-foot wide paved driveway. We're going to expand it to the 14 feet with two-foot gravel shoulders. Uh, the offset is minimal. Uh, we're 22 feet uh, right of center line uh, where the center line of the road is and the property line. So we're just a tad out of 25 feet and then up in this area in here it goes in the other direction. So basically we're just a little bit off center but not significantly and we did that in order to minimize the impact as far as disturbance for construction of the road. Not wanting to get into after impacting the two 36 inch culverts to go underneath that road uh, as well as there's some ledge in that area we're trying to stay away from to avoid having to do any additional ledge removal. Uh, one of the comments in the previous uh, memo from uh, Steve Harding was in regards to the monumentation. We sent a plan to Bob Malley for his review and he came back with comments and the updated plans that you have before you are the ones that show the monumentation uh, that Bob Malley had told us to go with. Uh, we also spoke with Bob in regards to the driveway to serve lot two coming off of the, the T turn. Uh, which in Mr. Harding's letter made comment that that was not allowed. I spoke with Bob. He didn't see an issue with it, but I haven't had a final letter or email back from Bob confirming that. Uh, the other requirement was to find out what the, determine the name for the road uh, connected with Chief Williams, and we proposed uh, Vineyard Lane and have an email back, which I believe you folks have in your packet, and that's what the name of the road would be. Uh, in terms of the proposed lot, in regards to building window itself, because I know there were some questions that some of the uh, neighbors had raised, the rear building limit of the building window is along the 250-foot RP1 setback line. And then part of this portion here is based on the zoning side setback. Then we have the 75-foot setback from the stream that impacts this corner of the building window. Then we have the zoning setback requirements here, and then the, set, the building window on this side is restricted based on where the, tote road, the easement is for the tote road. So that defines the, the building window. The total acreage for the proposed lot is 1.84 acres. The right of way consumes 0.39 acres, and re the remaining portion of the estate lot is 8.2 acres. Sure. Do you have an area for the uh, envelope? Yes. That's this section right in. No, oh, the actual area? No, I did not do the calculation. I can get that for you. And another easement that's been proposed on here will be a view easement that will come across this corner of the Holt property. It provides visual, ac visual access to the water and access for the folks from Lot 2 uh, to get to the water. Uh, I think that gives kind of a coverage of what the uh, existing changes were. Uh, we've reviewed Mr. Harding's letter. And there, as I said, there are somewhat minor and technical changes. The graphics, I'm still trying to figure out because when I print them in my office, they read fine. That's where we sent them to be printed. And whether their machine makes some adjustment, I'm not sure. But when I looked at a copy that came from them, I also had an issue with the way the lines were reading. So I've got to work that detail out so that that clears that one up. But in terms of all Steve's other comments, uh, uh, some of those have already been made uh, to the plans. and. Uh, and then with Maureen's comments, uh, those are pretty straightforward, unless you want me to go through them, and we have no issue with making those corrections. And I know we did receive a number of uh, emails that Maureen provided that came from the abutters, and I don't know whether you want to deal with that separately, or you want me to respond to the portions of that that I can respond to, or what's your pleasure? Well, um as far as completeness goes, it, it's more a substantive That's fine. Um, discussion, I think. Okay. All right. So, all right. Would anyone like to comment on whether the package is complete? That is, do we have the 
high level information necessary to move forward with the review of this project. We're not talking about the merits of the project or some of the minutia. We're talking about do we have all the, the information before us or that allows us to make determination to further discuss this project. So we'll bring that up to the public for comment. And uh, please state your name and your address. Uh, Thomas Magnabo, Cumberland. I represent Robert Flaherty, who's one of the abutters. All right, and we ask you to keep your comments to three minutes, please. Uh, my question is uh, whether or not the uh, wetland designation, which uh, the applicant has described as, a, as RP1 and RP2, uh, whether, whether or not uh, if that is not correct, whether that goes to completeness. In other words, I submitted a letter this afternoon which uh, indicates that, the, that that whole area southeast of the lot is designated on the town zoning map as, uh, as RP1. And there's been no application to change that by the applicant. And uh, uh, I don't understand uh, how that, how and why that line appeared where it did, uh, breaking the, the designation between RP1 and RP2. If it was all RP1, uh, it would seem to me that the envelope, uh, could not exist. <coughs> so my question is whether or not that's complete. I don't know. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Would you like to respond to that one? Um, yes, if you would like me to respond. I would like you to respond. I can to respond to that. So it's really, it's up to the board, but uh, a former planning board chair always would say that completeness doesn't equate to adequacy. So you have information that's presented to you that shows wetland boundaries. So based on that, you could deem this application complete. That doesn't mean that the information is satisfactory. So you could still ask the applicant to verify. Um, if you feel comfortable that the applicant will bring additional information forward, then maybe you deem it complete. If you cannot, if you're not comfortable with that, then if you deem it complete, you've got to be willing to deny this if no additional information comes forward. So that's the question. You, you, can, you could go with completeness and say, but I still need more information. And if they don't bring it, then you're really left with the whole, we'll just deny this application in the very end. Does that answer the question? Okay. And, and, and this is where I've actually spoken to Bob Metcalf about this. And it is my understanding that he is reaching back to his soil scientist to confirm that information. Um, there, is, uh, there is information that you have in your packet that the wetland boundaries were established uh, based on field work by a registered soil scientist. So that's, that is the first quality type of information you want. The concern is how far away from the area of construction did the soil scientist go and did he rely on mapping from an earlier application that may or may not have been taken directly from the zoning map? And taking things directly from the zoning map is not the right way to map wetlands. So we know that there's some good solid wetland mapping information on here. There's just a question of how far away from the property does that extend? And not from the property, how far away from the area of proposed construction does that extend? Victoria. When we got um, your letter, I did go back to uh, the work that Al Frick has done. Um, and we've worked with Al Frick quite a bit, and I do feel comfortable with him. In the third page of his letter, he addresses the Southern RP1 District. According to the Cape Elizabeth zoning map, an RP1 district runs along the southern property boundary to the eastern border by the ocean. This wetland was 
previously verified in the field by an Al Frick associate staff, and it was determined that only a portion of the mapped RP1 district is an RP1 wetland, with the remaining wetland to the east to be classified as an RP2 district. So, an Al Frick associate has been out there. They did make the determination of the wetland that we are discussing, and um, because somebody did look into this, and we have it in our package of material, I do feel comfortable that um, we, we have the information that we need in front of us, that that has been determined by a soil scientist to be an RP2 district. And that's what I would say as far as um, is this complete. I feel it is because we do have this in our material. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to completeness on this project? All right, seeing no one. I will turn it over to the board to, with their, do you have any questions on completeness for this or concerns? Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I'm not sure there's a question about completeness or the merits. I mean, last time you folks were in, uh, I was concerned about the lack of the topographical map as far as Latin goes and communicating with the finger problem. I fell to order very, very faint. That's the, the the topo is on there, and that's the issue of the printing. And I'm not, as I said, I'm not sure whether the folks we use to print their machine does an adjustment on the density, and that's why it comes out lighter. So we're going to have to work on that line weight again to figure out how we can make that heavier on our side, so that when they go to print it, it prints out clearly. Because when I take that same plan and run in my office on a copier that we have, I can read it. So I apologize for that. I mean, we changed the line weight from the last time, and it's still there made an adjustment that causes that to fade out. So. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Someone want to make a motion? Go ahead, Jonathan. Um, motion for the board to consider be. John, mic down. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Dr. William Holt to upgrade an existing driveway to provide frontage for a proposed lot located at 15 Running Tide Road be deemed complete with a waiver granted from, pro from providing the following information. Uh, aesthetic, cultural, and natural information, groundwater information, and a stormwater management plan. Be it for, further ordered that the application be taped. Oh, I guess I'll just stop there. <laughs> Do I have a second? Thank you, Henry. All right. Any further discussion on completeness? All right. All those in favor? Deeming it complete? It's unanimous. All right. Um, next, before we go on, I think we'll probably have some other questions, yep. but I just want to talk about site walk before I forget. <laughs> do we do we want to have a site walk? I'm seeing nodding. Yes. And okay, now it's time for all your calendars. <laughs> I'll just tell you, evening is better for me now than morning. So, and it does stay light later. Uh, 5.30. I can make 5.30 work. Any day. Any day. Yeah, just pick a day. Late rather than early. Yeah, yeah you won't get me at 5.30 a.m., I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, pick a day. Go ahead. I'm open. 5.30 is good. 5.30 is good. Jonathan's scowling at his calendar. I'm actually looking at the weather. <laughs> this week no snowstorms in the forecast. no snowstorms but they keep saying it's going to shower not wednesday we will not be doing the site walk on wednesday they're predicting an inch and a half of rain so mm -hmm. so do we want to try and do it friday i will not be available on friday as i will be on transit to canada <sighs> See my daughter's new house. Thursday? <laughs> Thursday? I can do it Thursday. Thursday. Thursday? 27th. Thursday. Thursday. Yep. 
Thursday the 27th? Potential cloudy. It's <laughs> cloudy. It's supposed to clear. <laughs> Foggy in the evening. So. All right. So the 27th at 5:30, and we'll meet at uh, 15. Um, running time. Running time. Road. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, should be at the end of running. Park around the circle. Should we? Yeah, should we park around the circle or? Yeah, there's probably enough room there. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Do you want to know? That's right. I will. I will. I always forget these things. So uh, the public is wel welcome to join us on the site walk on Thursday evening at 5:30. Um, I'm going to recommend everybody dress for anti-tick. Um, in their anti-tick clothing, so because I'm sure we'll be tromping over uh, fields and. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and keep you out of the woods where, as much as and possible. And wear your boots the, just in case. Yes. At 5:30. All right. Do I'll send you a reminder. Do we? Um, we want to. Does anybody have any questions or anything they want to? Ask Bob about about the merits of the project. About well, do you want to ask the public if they want to if they have any questions first about the merits, and then I can because I, I am going to announce a public hearing. And uh, is is a is it a public hearing tonight or not? Not tonight. Oh, okay. My I'll be scheduling one first. Sorry about that. I do have questions, but if somebody else wants to jump in. I have a question. I noticed that the whole the Broad Cove area is a one-way, is a dead-end system. Uh, once you've gone down Broad Cove Road from 77, the only way to get back out from anywhere is back the same way. So my question actually is for Maureen, I guess. Um, is a dead-end road the same as a dead-end district? Can I, answer Can I answer this, Maureen? Because I asked her the I asked her something this afternoon. <laughs> Technically, Broad Cove is not a dead end system because there is a gated access from Jordan Farm Road, which makes it which makes it have, have two means of egress. If it's open, oh, it, so it's two means of egress for emergency vehicles. It's that's a whole different discussion, <laughs> which we won't get into. But that is, that is the way it was set up, and uh, so it gives it two means of egress. Is not considered a dead end. So, go ahead, John. Um, I think there are some other uh, questions that I'm not sure the applicant could answer, but um, from the public. Uh, one was whether or not there were any other buildable lots uh, on that area. And actually, Maureen might be able to answer that too. Um, and the other was whether or not there was some sort of, uh, there could be access to Hannock for Cove Road, which I think the answer to that is a resounding no, given the fact that the property has now been split. Um, and there is no access, because I believe the, the Wasserman property um, sort of that the last subdivision um, yeah, cut that off from the back property correct um, so I don't think that really needs to be discussed anymore but uh, I know I think it was mrs. Wasserman that did bring up the uh, question about the other buildable lots and um, I'm not seeing any really the, other lots the but. other lots that are not under mr. Holt, dr. Holt's purview are part of the original 1970 subdivision for Broad Cove. Right. So I, I, I don't think that there are any other, uh, if that's really an appropriate question for this application myself, but I, I think kind of going off that, mm -hmm. I don't think there are any other. I think there is. From this. Right there, he's going to have, I think somebody's going to have to take that truck road, private road, and then Dr. Bull's house which is now on Hanford Cove Road, in my opinion, he got his house all the way over on one side, none of them set back. He could cut across, he could apply for an access road across there. Maybe I'm uh, extrapolating too much, but I see it. 
but he has set himself up to have a new road, and then that will be become the second exit for Broad Cove. But that property isn't under his control anymore. He it's doesn't control the entire length of the tote road. To Hannaford, to his other property on Hannaford Cove Road, that's been cut down the middle, and that's owned by the Wassermans. Does he? I guess I don't. We don't have the plans there. The tote road comes in through Maxwell's. Right. From Two Lights Road. It ends right here on the. And home. goes down through, and right now it cut, cuts over Maxwell's. Pro well, Shirley Maxwell's property, Dr. Holt's property, the Wassermans' property, and then. These these two lots, the estate lot. If he so, would, could, would he have to get an easement or would there permission to go across those? They're all owned by all that property is owned by somebody else. And that was something that came up during the last time that we discussed this similar property. And that tote road does not give access to Hannaford Cove Road. It comes off Two Lights Road. Um. So nobody sees any way right now. Unless you own all of that property, there's no way you could do that. <clears throat> I think you'd need From the agreement of lights, numerous property okay. owners that would get together. But in theory, that could happen all the time. No, I'm not convinced. I have a plan. No. No. I just, my, I have a gut instinct. I just have a gut instinct that there's a way that can be done. But once the purpose of the purpose of splitting this estate lot in two is to sell two lots, and then once they're sold, then you've got another another group of people involved. That there's no one who owns access all the way from Two Lights Road to the to the ocean on this piece of property. Well, I'll, I'll drop it for now, but I'm going to, you know, it's, it's I'm not going to quit thinking about it. Okay. <laughs> Anything's possible at any time, you know, at, at, at a future date. You never can, right. you know, someone might come in and buy them all up. Who knows? No. Go ahead, John. The only other thing is more of a question for Maureen. Maureen, there was a question, or we got an email late today um, about the piece of wetland that is on the uh, sort of on the border between the proposed new lot and the Bagan property. Yes. Can you kind of tell us a little bit more about that email about the whether or not it qualified as a vernal pool? And right. from my so, reading, it didn't. It did not. Right. So the, the you know there's been questions by the board and by the public about that. And the applicant has actually gone out there a couple of times. Once they mapped the RP2, they found a small RP2 wetland in there. And then the second time, they went back to confirm that it is not a vernal pool. So it is a, an RP2 wetland, which means that under our current ordinances, you can get right up close to it. And as long as you don't alter it, you do not need a resource protection permit. And this proposal by the applicant is not proposing to get near it because um, the, there's a, the other wetlands on the property, the RP1 wetlands have a 250 foot buffer, which are pushing all of the development away from both wetlands, both the RP1 and that little RP2. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Victoria. Um, I was looking at your waiver list, and um, I was looking at number three, your utility, I was going through this and comparing it to our ordinance. I don't see that this is a waiver for anything in our ordinance. And um, so just, and I could ask the town planner, um, my thoughts on number three is I could not line it up with our ordinance that this is a waiver. Your thoughts on number three, the utility? I think my sense is that the applicant is trying to be very diligent in identifying every single design in the plan that is not exact to our ordinance, but they are not necessarily considered waivers. Okay. So some of the things are waivers and some of the things are not. Um, talking about, I think you said number three, Which you and this is the March. Great. I, I can probably clarify that. I can clarify that one for you. 
Okay, the, I just didn't think it was a yeah. waiver. I well, at the, at the time we originally submitted the waivers, we did not have Portland Water District's response back. So it was more or less a waiver for that until we'd received information. So we now have information from the Water District, which is reflected on the plans you have that shows where the water main is and where the new water services come off of. We had, we had submitted everything prior to the last completeness meeting, and the Water District, you know, basically they now have a 40-day requirement for turnaround from the time you ask them a question. And uh, in between all that, the fellow who was reviewing this went on vacation, so we had a little bit of a lag time. So uh, we actually received this about three days before we submitted the plans that you have now. So and, and number five, the closed drainage system. I also didn't think that that was a waiver. It seems more like a design standard, that you are asking a design not to include curbing and drainage, where our town engineer and Bob Malley both agree that drainage is important. So it's, I don't see it as a waiver other than... It may have been my interpretation of Steve's comment about that, that it's under the road standards, and that's why I probably put it in there as a waiver request not to have to do the closed drainage system and curbing. I think in Steve's letter, he also recognized the fact that what we were trying to minimize the amount of infrastructure that went in and disturbance, that, that the amount of additional impervious and runoff was negligible. So he seemed to be fine with the concept, but I interpreted what he said is that we needed to request a waiver for not doing that, so. Okay, I actually saw where he said, no, the town engineer wants the drainage and the curbing. So I'm not going to debate that with you. I'm just going to say, can you please touch bases around yep. uh, the drainage and the curbing with the town? The engineer. one curbing issue that I did see that Steve and Bob agreed on is the curbing at the entrance the off radius. of Running Hill, Running Tide, but not for the full length. It was just the radiuses where this new road meets Running Tide, the cul-de-sac portion. Not that he was looking for the curbing down the entire roadway. Okay, so, so that, that's what I understood when looking at it. That, so my question is, are you comfortable with the, with the town engineer's request to have curbing at the radii? Yes, that's not a problem. So that's something you'll just put on the next set of plans? Exactly. Okay. Actually, they've already been made, you just don't have them. Okay, so. good to know. Okay, thank you for clarifying yeah. that. No problem. All right, um, next question. Um, and I do share, there was a concern over here, there's a concern over here about how, and this is a quote from the town engineer, the plan is a challenge to read and difficult to follow. You've addressed it, I know you said that. I'm still hoping that the next time we see you. I know, I, I apologize profusely and I'm trying to figure out why we sent a file to the printer to print and I don't, as I said, I don't know whether equipment does an adjustment in terms of the way things read. Then I've got to figure that out. Have a plan set so I can look at it without having everything reproduced and then figure out if it's something we have to do with the line weight on our CAD drawings. Okay. I'm as exasperated as you are. So. And the town engineer. It's yeah. really town engineer. Um, next comment. Um, I would like to see your letter to the main DEP to confirm that the plan you submitted to the main DEP includes the DEP stream and the 75-foot setback line and the request to expand the access within the right of way. It was the current a, letter from the main DEP is vague, and in fact, it indicates that if, this is a quote, if the road work is contained within the existing footprint, as I understand it to be, then no main DEP permit is required. Um, but you're making a, a there, this is a request to expand because Al Frick said in his letter. Uh, first of all, the wetland impacts within 25 feet of the DEP stream are not eligible for a normal review process and therefore would require an individual NRPA review and the applicant has not shown any documentation. Also that uh, Ms. Arbo at the main DEP is aware that per Al Frick, a DEP jurisdiction stream bisects the right of way. So I'm concerned about that. Right. And also Al Frick said, quote, an expansion of the existing access within the right-of-way will require a Section 2 and 10 permit by the rule from the DEP because it requires fill in a DEP stream in soil disturbance within 75 foot of the DEP stream. So the letter to the, from Maine DEP says um, if 
it doesn't if it if it's within the existing footprint uh, then it's okay it's I, vague. I, I, I understand vague. she asked me to provide we had a verbal conversation then asked me to put the points in and then she responded back that way I will reach out to her again and get you more of a clarification Al's letter is in case we were going to further impact the wetland areas which we are not that's why we're narrowing the road up we don't want to impact the existing culverts. That's why the road's being narrowed up. So we're trying to prevent any additional activities that would incur a need to get a DEP permit as far as wetlands are concerned. But I will reiterate the comment, and I'll get you an updated letter. It, it, I mean, if she's going to, if if, they're, if you can't get the pin them down kind of thing, if yeah. I could see your letter, yep. you know, with the detail, the stream, the setback, yep, we can and do that. they still come back kind of vague, like, looks good. Yep. We can do that. If it's Not a in problem. your letter, I would take it. Not okay. a problem. Um, also, um, and it was noted from the town planner that, and I would like to see that the highest annual tide line be corrected to use the town's normal high water line. Um, it, and it was in there, and I would like to see yeah. that. Um, let's see. There was also um, a note from last month, last time you were here, that the town engineer wanted to see this comment added, a note added to the plan in regards to the road maintenance agreement. Um, no, actually, um, okay, I'm jumping ahead. Okay, the town engineer wanted to see a reference to the requirement that the contractor be certified in erosion and sediment control by the DEP to work on this project. So he mentioned in the last letter, mm -hmm. I didn't see that it was added to the plan and he didn't reiterate it, but. I will go back to the plans to make sure it's there, it was on my red line set to be done, so. Okay, um, let's see. I did want to see something. This was me that, uh, about the road maintenance agreement. I do want to see one because mm -hmm. we do section 1979A. Yep. It does say no building permit shall be issued until a legally binding road maintenance agreement is established. So I will be looking for the road maintenance agreement. Oh, that's, I thought we would be submitting that for the final review, so okay. that'll be done. And you're still working with Porter Walk? Portland Water District? I'm nope, they're fine. The plans you have reflect where the water main is, where the new hydrant goes, and how the service for the new lot and for Dr. Holt's existing residents are, are located. So those plans have been modified to, okay. to show that. They send out vague letters too. Everyone's really vague. Yeah. Nobody wants to uh, put it down. Okay, those. Sometimes it's hard to get them to write a letter that's usually just an email response. So. Yeah. So, anyways, those were the comments. I appreciate you yeah. answering those yeah. for me. Thank sure. you. Any anybody else got anything? I do have one thing, and that's from one of the abutters, Bob. Yep, I'm listening. I'll talk slowly. <laughs> get all your notes down. I got that. Um, the the uh, people at at Seven Running Tide Road with their concern about the RP2 wetlands that are in between. Oh, the Bagan property? The, the Bagan property, right. yes. Um, and their comment in their letter regarding diseased and decaying trees uh, not allowing clearing to, to try and minimize any clearing of anything, even diseased and decaying trees. Mm -hmm. Well, um, in terms of the diseased or decaying trees, anything that becomes a safety hazard, I mean, if somebody inadvertently goes onto the property and something falls on them, that's the issue. So I removing just, safety hazards. Some of the other comments in there, I can talk to Dr. Holt about uh, in terms of any of the language. But if it's a safety issue and if something falling, I understand that, that needs to be addressed. I understand so. that. Um, but um, I think it's pretty common practice that uh, tree removal outside the building envelope does not occur without the code enforcement officer being sure being involved and therefore uh, maybe adding a note to the plan sure. to that effect to, to ensure that that's there and that's that's all. Because mm -hmm. I, I agree with you uh, when it comes to to removal of, of uh, yeah. dead trees can be hazardous. So that's all. That was my, <laughs> my one comment. So I know I'm doing this a little backwards, but now I'll open it up to um, anyone in the audience would like to uh, comment on the merits of this project. Please state your name, uh, address, and uh, you know, three minutes. 
<laughs> won't take that long. I'm Trish Wasserman at Three Running Tide Road, and I had sent questions in advance, and I have to say I'm really sorry. I just don't think I have an answer yet that I understand to Running Tide Road and the dead end rule as it pertains to Running Tide Road, and, and just a simple question, how many houses can be built on Running Tide Road in addition to the 21 that are already there? And, and would this add, if this, I, I don't, I haven't been able to get a copy of the rule. I thought it was 20 on a dead end. I don't know what the rule is I asked for clarification of the rule. And if there are already 21 houses, is there a problem potentially adding, there could be, I think, three more houses built on Running Tide Road based on the maps I could find with them. There are two lots, one now for sale, that's a buildable lot also on Running Tide Road, Oceanfront, and another one that is not currently for sale but was for sale, that's also another buildable lot. So that would put us up to potentially 23 or 20, I think 23 houses. And then could there be additional houses built on any of the existing um, estate lot house? That's not the separate lot. Just a clarification, I'd really appreciate that. And how that dead end rule does or does not relate to what's going on. That's Thank it. You. Anyone else would like to ask a question or make a comment? All right, close, oh, go ahead. Running Tide Road, and I just have a question as well. Um, I'm a little bit concerned that while you've agreed that it was a, a completed application, what concerns me is the fact that the applicant is continuing to say, well, we'll get that to you, and we'll get it, and it was the printer. And I find that very annoying. I don't think I'd be able to do that at my job. Um, and what particularly I find upsetting is the fact that the building envelope is at a higher level than my home. And the topography is very important. If that, if, if that building envelope is rearranged in such a way that what I'm worried about is that it'll be high enough that it will run toward my house. And I asked in, the, in my letter if there's some kind of protection there um, that can be asked for. If it does occur, I mean, maybe it won't, but if it does, Who's responsible? Do I then have to go out and dig a well in my backyard to soak up all this excess runoff? I think the fact that we're not seeing topography is concerning, and I, I, I would like someone to look into that. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Right. Okay. Public comment period. So, Maureen, would you like to address the dead end? road question. Sure. Um, and I thought I had explained this at the February meeting, um, but I can do round two. So uh, the, dead end, the dead end rule, the dead end rule is really a standard in the subdivision ordinance, which means that it only applies when you are reviewing a subdivision. If you are reviewing a lot that's on a road that already does not meet the dead end road standard, but the lot itself does not trigger subdivision review, then the dead end standard does not apply. It just does not apply. So this is not a, a subdivision review, it's a private road review. And because it's just a private road review, the dead end standard does not apply. So because it does not apply, it does not matter how many potential additional homes could be built on Running Tide Road because it's not being triggered. So there could be 15 vacant lots on Running Tide Road and it would not matter. And that's why we have not evaluated the buildability of the remaining land on Running Tide Road and the land owned by Dr. Holt. If this was a subdivision review, which it is not, then the burden would be on the applicant to make that evaluation. And in fact, 
the Cottage Brook development, we required the developer to figure out how many lots were at the end of the roads that they were building at the end of, and that was included in the application. So that's why we're not evaluating how many lots are left that can be built on, how many additional lots could be created, uh, because the dead end road standard only applies to subdivisions, and this is not a subdivision review. Any questions on that? No, but I understand that, but is it, you're still adding houses to a dead end road. I mean, it is. And, and, I know what you're and Mr. Hubner, I, what I try to remind people is that we don't always get to be logical. <laughs> we, we have to follow the ordinances. And there are times when I sit in my office and the code officer and I have conversations and I get frustrated because, of course, this is the way we should do things. But unless we have a legal right to apply a standard to someone, we cannot make people do things. Okay, I understand. Marie, if I could add to the uh, Dr. Holmes disposed of some other parcels. Uh, the main parcel I had a question back a few meetings ago as to whether those in the aggregate would constitute some of them. And I believe he supplied a, uh, what we call a type of opinion, as well as the vice council, that those other transactions were not transactions that were both some of them. Yes, and it was staff who instructed the applicant that they needed to come, they needed to provide a legal opinion that subdivision had not been triggered. And I think Dr. Holt owned more than 20 acres, and he merged his 20 acres with another lot, so you still only have one lot, and then he did do a couple of divisions. But under the state subdivision law, there are exemptions. There are ways that you can divide your land, and it isn't counted towards the three lots in a five-year period which trigger subdivision review. So when Dr. Holt sold land to Mrs. Wasserman, she's an abutter. And when you sell land to an abutter, that can be an exempt lot. Um, Dr. Holt also carved off a lot and merged it with another lot in another subdivision. Again, that's another exemption because it's an abutting lot. There are other exemptions. You can carve off lots and give them to family members, and those don't count towards subdivision. So we have a record in, in our file that shows that the only thing that Dr. Holt is required to apply for right now to create one more lot is a private road review because the proposed lot does not have adequate frontage on a town accepted road. That's the, that's the extent of the review. I don't believe Dr. Holt is, a, is um, you might be altering a wetland anywhere, and if, no, not altering a wetland, so you don't need a resource protection permit. Victoria? Um, on that last question about water and runoff onto the property, um, could you help me with, is there anything that, um, I'm not sure, code enforcement, for, uh, is there anything around making sure that somebody does not have water? I, the Bacons have met with me and um, have expressed their concerns, and I have spoken to the town engineer who's reviewing these plans and asked him to pay particular attention to how water is moving on the west side of the new lot towards the Bacon lot. And he has not yet found any evidence that water is going to be moving towards their lot. But again, we'll get better information on wetlands, uh, excuse me, on topography. And he can again look at the next set of plans. We can ask the applicant to make sure in their next, in their next submission, perhaps they could use a paragraph to describe how the water moves within the building envelope versus the, the remainder of the lot. Well, but can, you're right, if let's say that everybody does their job and, and it doesn't look like there's going to be a problem and then there is a problem. Um, that does become a civil matter. Okay. Can, Go ahead, Bob. I was going to try and answer that for you. One at the last workshop session or the last meeting we had in regards to this, I made a comment that uh, we'd be willing to put a note on the plan that basically says as a condition that whoever, when they go to pull a building permit for that, a grading plan be provided 
to the code enforcement officer of review to make sure we're not dealing with grading drainage, excuse me, going down towards the vacant property. While you can't read the topo on here, and I can't point to a map, where that building window is, the way the grades are, they pretty much fall from the back or where the 300 to 250 foot RP line is towards the new road. So the grade, everything pretty much flows down towards the, uh, where the private road is going to be. If, if you feel that confident and um, you're going to put something on the... Yeah, we'll put a note on the point. If, unless the board disagrees with something like that, I wouldn't mind seeing sure. you put your own restrictions on yourself. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Would you say that again, Victoria? Oh, sorry. Um, the applicant just uh, said he would... I, we will put a note on the plan that prior to issuance of a building permit on that lot, a grading plan be provided to the code officer for review. And as I said, you know, the way the topo on that site is, it pretty much runs from the 250-foot uh, RP1 setback line, and the fall of the grade pretty much goes towards the new proposed private road. Jonathan? I, I was hoping that, um, and I appreciate that, that uh, suggestion to put the note on the plan. Um, I was hoping that, if possible, the applicant could sort of uh, put some stakes out for the site walk of the building envelope um, that we'd be able to see sort of at least that portion um, of where the building envelope kind of curves around or uh, where that RP1 buffer um, stops within the property so we can actually get sort of a better assessment of how that would affect uh, the abutters. I will do what I can as short notice we need to have a I survey go out. Day, but I will pull tape to, it, to delineate it. I'll get you close enough to where yeah, it is. Yeah, I know and I'm not too, com I, personally I'm not too concerned about where, where the building envelope is going to be on the other portions of the property, just sort of that back line if that's sure. possible. Yeah, I can try to do that. Anything else? Any other? Things that Bob needs to take notes on. Right, would someone like to make a motion regarding public hearing? Motion, motion on public hearing. Go ahead, Peter. That's a table. Of yeah, no. We've done it. Just the public hearing. Table until May, May 16th. We have a second. 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 Any further discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. All right. You guys are good to go. See you Thursday. Bob, I expect to see you up there in your rain gear putting up stakes on Wednesday. <laughs> I thought I'd go out now and do a long Okay. All right, item three on our agenda. Item, excuse me, item four. Nelson Private Access Way Permit. Don Nelson is requesting a private access way permit to make an existing lot with insufficient frontage buildable and located at 4 Silva Drive, section 19-7-9, private access way, completeness and public hearing this evening. Good evening. Go ahead. I'm Don Nelson. I reside at 1180 Sawyer Road. Uh, the 4 Silva Drive is a property that I own where currently it's uh, where my garage is. Um, I'd be interested in trying to develop that and get a build a residence on that to uh, live in. <laughs> and uh, I've been through some work here where Maureen's been very helpful taking me through the step-by-step uh, -step through the procedures and uh, I think I've got most everything covered uh, and hope that you agree. Does anybody have any questions on completeness? I feel, my personal feeling is 
done a good job. Thank you. We have information, map. I second that. I think you've, you've, um, you've, met, the, you've met the standard for Well, I have to thank opinion. Maureen has been uh, quite good. I visited her several times and she took me through the process after that initial meeting, learning the steps and it, uh, it is it's a bit of a process, but uh, it's just, it's okay, now it's done and I have a much better idea what to expect coming up. Does anybody have any questions for Don? On completeness? On completeness. No? Does someone want to make a motion then? I'll do it. Go ahead. Motion for completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Donald Nelson for a private access way permit to make an existing non-conforming lot with insufficient frontage located at 4 Silva Drive, U46-2, buildable, be deemed complete. Do you have a second? Second. second. <coughs> Any discussion? All those in favor? All right, it's unanimous. All right, let's, let's move on. I, before we start talking, well, <laughs> public hearing. <Yeah. laughs> Since I'll just note there's no one present for public hearing, so we'll just move on. Does anyone feel the need for a site walk on this property? I know personally I do not. I, I grew up on Silva Drive, so from walking up the bus. I'm pretty familiar with the area, so I don't think it's necessary. Pretty flat, open. Yes. Yeah. I checked it out. I rode the bike. All right. So let's, let's move on to any questions or concerns regarding the merit. The I, I just wanted to ask, I know the town engineer does want you to put in a single trench. You didn't have any issues with that? I mean, no, I, there's an existing overhead power line now that serves that garage. It has got its own CMP account. Mm -hmm. um, I know I have to trench for the water, uh, but I'm feeling if the residence is going to be set back, that they probably would put uh, bring the power underground. So it would be one a single trench to do power and water. Okay, because it was a recommendation, but I just wanted to. Yes, yes. So he, bring it yeah, up he, I. Uh, it makes sense, but then I, I got to thinking about it that this dangling old power line overhead, you know, and it would need a post or a pole anyways to bring it to. And I've seen what a neighbor of mine did. And it looked, he brought it in and just came under. So there's nothing, those wires going to the side of the house and all, so. Okay, so no problem with that recommendation by the town engineer. No, that's. I, I just wanted to. Suitable. Those thoughts. Okay, that was it. Anybody else? Everything seemed pretty straightforward to me. Yeah, so. yeah it did. I just and, uh, wanted his thoughts. All right. <laughs> Go ahead, John. I have a motion for approval. Uh, findings of fact. Uh, one, Donald Nelson is requesting a private access permit to make an existing non conforming lot with insufficient frontage located at Fort Silver Drive, uh, U46 2, buildable, which requires review under Section 1979, private access ways. Two, the fire chief is waiving the requirement for a turnaround. Three, the code enforcement officer supports provisions of an HHE 200 form des uh, designing the septic system as part of the building permit for the road maintenance agreement is not needed due to the short length of the driveway serving only one lot. Five, the lot is in a developed neighborhood where a physical inspection of the site demonstrates adequate site distance. Six, the applicant will likely be making utility connections in Silver Drive, which was paved last year. The public works director prefers that a single wider trench be used for utility connections instead of multiple trenches. Uh, seven, the application substantially complies with section 17, excuse me, 1979, private access ways, and section 1983, resource protection regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Donald Nelson for a private access permit to make an existing non conforming lot with insufficient frontage located at Fort Silver Drive, U46 2, buildable, be approved, subject to the following conditions. One, that an HHE 200 <coughs> form designing 
the subsurface water disposal system be submitted and approved by the code enforcement officer prior to the issuance of a building permit. Two, that the curb radii of the driveway uh, be of adequate size to allow access for the fire department ladder truck. Three, that a single trench across Silver Drive be used to establish uh, utility connections to the new lot. Second. Henry seconds. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Oh, I think you just set a record. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Maureen, thank you very much for, and I know I have a few more procedures to go through, but that's a good start. That was just interesting to hear some of the other <laughs> processes oh, going through, too. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it does take a while, I understand, but it's, it's how you get to do it. It's, you did a good job. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Don. Thanks, Don. Thanks. All right. Right. Gee, um, public comment on items not on the agenda. Uh, since there's no public one, here, I guess we can skip that. I just want to say that I'm not going to be at the May 16th meeting. I have to be away for work, so. Oh, and that reminds me, uh, there's a very important concert going on at the middle school on May 16th. I will show up when I can. <laughs> Anybody, Anybody else? else for May 16th? <laughs> What's that? Anyone else who can't be <laughs> May 16th? <laughs> uh, I mostly won't be here, unfortunately. I'm going, or fortunately, I'm going to New Mexico, so. Wow. Okay. It'd be a bit of a long drive. One, two, wow. three, four. Any, any one of the four people left who might not be here on the 16th? Four. 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 Yeah. yeah, so <laughs> with respect, if anyone can't make it other than Henry, Victoria, and John, you need to let me know. ASAP because we'll need to move the meeting. And I expect Maxwell Woods to be on that agenda. I expect the first submission of the dental office to be on that agenda. And the public hearing on the whole property to be on that agenda. That's just the workshop or the meeting? It's, it's the, the meeting. meeting. It's the I think we should, I personally would like to see it move then. Uh, but that's. Yeah, yeah. Any thoughts on when you want it moved to? No, that's too. Well, I'm assuming that we're not going to pick up Mr. Steinberg if you just move it one day. No, it'd have to be later if you want me to turn up, but then, you know, if you don't. What's your schedule? I'm actually flying to New York <laughs> at 12 o'clock on the 16th. and. I'm scheduled to be back at 11.30 that night. So. The next day. I, you right. Did that Any just, Monday just or Tuesday. You to miss the meeting, didn't you? Yeah. So, I, yes. Yes. No. So, kidding. Public. So would Wednesday the 17th be still, are you going to be awake by Wednesday night or? Was I awake tonight? Um, <laughs> yes, I should be. If the room's available. Uh, no. I can't. I have a meeting. That's the third Wednesday. Right. What about yeah, the 18th the is a Thursday? That's fine. Most people can do Thursday the 18th, except for Henry. Why don't I um, see if I can make sure the room's available, and, and I will send out a confirming email if the 18th is going to work for everyone. Okay? Because it's the same week, that should be okay for most of the applicants. So. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, that was good. That was the only one. Better than finding it out on May 12th. <laughs> so that frees you up for an excellent band concert at the middle school on the 16th. Oh, oh I'll be in New York. <laughs> All right, I, I, need a, I need to hear a motion. Motion to adjourn. stay here. Uh, adjourn. Uh, do I have a second? Is there any discussion? Anyone want to stay? All those in favor? All right. We're adjourned. I'm really